Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to yet another lore summary of the Beast Arises book series, now on book three. After the rather tumultuous occurrences of the last two books, the Imperium is now in an open state of war with this new green-skinned threat. But it is a very unique war, one that the Imperium has not really seen before. This is not the old days when the Adeptus Astartes legions had overall command over quite literally everything, army, Adeptus, Mechanicus, and navy. Now, this power lies in the hands of mortals, but usually the Imperial Guard would have a far greater role to play than in this particular conflict, with the Orc threat being almost entirely spaceborne, with all of the planets that actually get attacked by the Orcs directly virtually never succeeding to hold on against the Orcs for any extended period of time, except for a handful of occurrences with Adeptus Astartes homeworlds or death worlds, the Imperial Guard haven't really had a whole lot to do. There's simply nowhere to reinforce. There's simply no point in dispatching regiments of Imperial Guard from Terra or anywhere else in the Imperium because where the fuck would you send them? Nobody has any idea where the Orcs are going to pop up next, and as such, even defensive measures doesn't really work out. If anything, the Guard is now entirely at the mercy of the Navy to get them to where they need to be, and when they need to be there. This means that the High Admiral of the Navy, Lansung, enjoined near limitless political and military power at this point. It would be no exaggeration to say that, at this point, the very future of the Imperium rested in his hands. And he knew it. Not one to let a chance pass him by, Lansing was using the situation to increase his own political capital. His supporters, both within the Senatorum Imperialis, had any request for aid they may send to the Imperial Navy swiftly answered, and as such Imperial Guard regiments and Navy formations would be dispatched with all due haste to aid their allies. However, those who hesitated to recognize Lansung's superiority in, well, pretty much all things at this point, they had their requests unfortunately bogged down within imperial bureaucracy. Unfortunate, but unavoidable. At least as far as Lansung was concerned. This was a stark reminder to many doubtfuls within the High Lords, the Inquisition and the Officio amongst them, that the High Lords would put their own personal gains, privileges and position well ahead of any concerns that the Imperium might have. And let's touch upon that for just a moment, because I think it's a bit interesting. I do not think that Lansung, nor any of the High Lords, were doing this out of malice. After all, never attribute to malice that which can adequately be explained by stupidity. I don't think Lansung wanted to see the Imperium burn, obviously because he was one of the primary beneficiaries of the Imperium. Neither do I think that any of the other High Lords actively wanted for the Imperium to lose out or be destroyed. But as in the earlier case, where Lansung's old seat of power, a world out on the fringes, received a large government contract to build starships, despite the fact that other places could give better starships at a lower cost, the High Lords probably just simply thought that this wasn't a huge problem. Lansung undoubtedly thought that this wasn't a big issue. It would cost the Imperium billions of thrones, true, but compared to the total income of the Imperium, it was minuscule. It was probably a fraction of a percentage. It was nothing. And in return, Lansung could secure his own political and popular position on his home world, while padding his pockets quite nicely along the way. It wasn't an issue. It wouldn't hurt the Imperium to any real degree. Of course, by doing this, you very quickly lose perspective. If one person knocks off a fraction of a percentage, and another person knocks off another fraction of a percentage, and so on and so on, the numbers start adding up rather quickly. And no one could really 
be blamed, or, well, everyone could be blamed, but the individual would never blame themselves in this situation. They would simply go, well, I didn't do all of this. I only took a little bit of a massive pile. This is not my fault. And I suspect this is exactly the thoughts that were racing through Lansung's mind at this very moment. The orcs were not a real threat. They were just orcs, animals. They'd been relegated to the borders of the Imperium for centuries. They weren't actually dangerous. This was a minor orc incursion, a fluke. It would be dealt with in due course. In fact, he could gather the navy and crush them outright. It wasn't a problem. But as long as everyone else thought it was a problem, he could take advantage of that. Now, of course, if you take a step back, and you realize that Lansung's hesitation were costing the lives of billions, hundreds of billions of Imperial citizens, costing the Imperium entire planets, many of which were permanently lost due to their population denying the orcs in the most base way possible by setting off Armageddon-level weapons and wiping both themselves, the orcs, and the planet themselves, in many cases, from the galactic map. As such, while it might seem absolutely monstrous to simply not send aid, or at the very least, delay the sending of aid to such a point where it no longer matters, would seem atrocious. It meant the death of billions. How could Lansung even live with himself? Well, I think that Stalin put it Oh, so perfectly, when he said that one death is a tragedy, a million a statistic. And all Lansung could see were statistics. This was made even more obvious in a speech he held to the High Council, where he announced his military plans in the vaguest terms possible. At this point, Lansung was not so much a military leader preparing for a campaign upon which the entire fate of the Imperium might very well rest, but more of a politician, trying to make damn sure that he's closed all of the loopholes and made sure that he can't get ambushed in any way politically. And, perhaps even more importantly, he was trying to make very, very sure that no matter what happened, no one else could take the responsibility for a victory, but at the same time, if it should fail, the blame should be equally divided. And since at this point in time, none of the other High Lords were in a position to directly oppose the High Lord of the Admiralty, Lansung was pretty much free to do whatever he wanted to do. The various other High Lords had holdings, either already under direct threat from the Orcs, or very soon to be, and since, as previously established, pretty much all of the High Lords considered their own holdings to be far more important than the well-being of the Imperium as a whole, the Council was essentially paralyzed when it came to dealing with the Lansung's ambition. The only one who made an attempt was the High Lord of the Officio Assassinorum. By praising the High Admiral's skill at military actions, the High Lord of the Officio attempted to make Lansung commit himself to direct military action, stating such things as, seeing as the Orcs make up such a considerable threat, the Imperium needs to send their very best Admiral to deal with them. And obviously, the only Admiral who could be considered the best would be Lansung himself. Unfortunately, Lansing had seen this coming, and easily outmaneuvered the High Lord of the Officio. And indeed, the Grand Master of Assassins himself later admits in his own memoirs that it was a mistake to try and outmaneuver Lansung in this way. It was a result of the Grand Master's annoyance at the situation, and feeling of apparent helplessness rather than his usual cold and detached planning. It was, to put it simply, a folly to think that an experienced politician like Lansung wouldn't have seen such a maneuver coming from miles away. For the moment, the Admiral was safe, although he was going to get his comeuppance soon enough, but before that, a really interesting turn of events. 
Understandably somewhat miffed by the loss of every single goddamn one of his battle brothers, Curland needs to find some way of fighting back against the beast. Now, being alone makes this somewhat complicated. Space Marines might be pretty damn powerful, but a single Imperial Fist is still going to have a fairly hard time taking on the entirety of the Orc Empire. As such, we are introduced to a rather interesting little mechanic. Apparently, Rogal Dawn was never entirely convinced by his brother Gilliman's arguments for the need to split up the legions and adapt the Codex Astartes as a standard basis for all future Adeptus Astartes formations. As such, the most stoic of all of the Emperor's son had worked in a little bit of a safeguard. This safeguard took the name of the Last Wall Protocol. It was a special signal that could be sent out to all of the Imperial Fist successor chapters when it was deemed necessary, which would start a reunification of the Legion. Now, granted, as far as Rogel Dawn was concerned, this would probably have been the call to literally reorganize the legions. However, over the last thousand years, the various chapters had grown quite different. The Black Templars were very different to the Imperial Fists. The Crimson Fists were very different to the Black Templars, and so on. As such, the idea that the Imperial Fist Legion could ever be recreated might have been a bit of a pipe dream. Or at the very least, it would require something very, very special, like, you know, the return of Rogal Dawn himself. But even without the technical reunification of the Legion, the Last Wall Protocol still meant that the forces of several Adeptus Astartes chapters would all be gathered up behind a single leader. Now, it might not have the cohesion of the old legions and will almost certainly not be as effective, nevertheless, a formation of thousands, possibly even tens of thousands, space marines, all under the unified leadership of a single command structure, well, that is a pretty damn powerful proposition. And while all of this excitement was going on in space, Admiral Langsung had been forced to leave Terra. Now, unsurprisingly, he did not want to leave Terra, because the moment he sets foot off the Holy Planet is the moment he loses all of his political control over the situation. However, he had been forced to do this due to the ambitions of an underling. One of the captains commanding parts of the large fleet that Lang Sung had gathered up had received intelligence about an orc attack moon and saw this as his opportunity to strike before everyone else's and garner the credit of destroying an attack moon without anyone else's input. This was a move uh, right out of Lang Sung's own playbook. Unfortunately, the young captain was not quite up to the task which caused many, many problems for very, very many people. And particularly for Lansung. He now had to pretend that this had all been part of his master plan all along, as any other course of action would essentially be him admitting that he was not in control of his own fleet. And you don't need me to tell you that doing so would mean kissing farewell to all of the political leverage he had been able to build up over the last few weeks. And so the brave Admiral boarded his flagship and left to take command of the counterattack. A counterattack, it is worth noting, that Lansung actually did not have any plans of actually carrying out until he was forced to do so by his ambitious underlings. Essentially, if he defeated the Orc Attack Moon, he would lose leverage. He was working this Orc threat for everything that he was worth, and Lansung was still not entirely convinced that the Orcs were an actual threat. As far as Lansung and indeed many of the other High Lords were concerned, the Orcs were still very much so a theoretical threat, something to be taken advantage of, and most certainly not something that were threatening their positions directly. However, in this situation, he had no choice but to leave Terra, because it was lose-lose. If the young Admiral was defeated, then Lansung would be sitting there with all of the responsibility, in addition to the apparent fact that he can't control his own fleet. 
and if by some miracle the young officer was to prove successful, Lansung would be sitting there with none of the glory, but all of the responsibility. The young admiral that bravely led the charge and took the initiative would be garnering all of the glories of the battlefield, and Lansung would be sitting there with the butcher bill. In addition to the rather uncomfortable question, why did you leave this up to someone else? Didn't you think this was an important enough task for your own esteemed High Lordship? Maybe if you had led it, a oh, wise and brilliant leader as you have so claimed to be previously, we wouldn't have so many dead Imperials floating through space. And thusly, the High Admiral Lansing was sent skittering off to Port Sanctus, where he had to defeat an Orc Attack Moon head-on. Not quite the position he had imagined, but infinitely preferable to the alternative. But now we take a quick break from the intrigues of the High Lord and go over to the intrigues of the Inquisition. The current Inquisitorial High Lord Venon gets a visit from some old friends who really, really, really doesn't like her, and generally speaking want her fired from her job, and getting fired within the Inquisition usually means getting shot in the back of the head, which for some reason Venon doesn't seem to be too partial for. And this is the internal power struggles of the Inquisition. While the High Lords might certainly be fairly cutthroat, they all know that they can't really make an open move against each other because they command far too much power. However, the Inquisitorial representative does in all due technicality not wield any more power than a regular Inquisitor, which means that her brand new Inquisitorial friends who visited her to try and kick her out of her seat had a more direct approaches that they could take other than simply voting her out of office, and this is why Venon found herself fleeing through the streets of Terra with a rough half a dozen assassins tight on her tail. Luckily for today's damsel in distress, the Grand Master of the Officio had decided that he was quite fond of the Inquisitorial representative, if for no other reason than she was relatively easy to trick and had a nasty habit of hiring idiot bodyguards that he could play around with. Somewhat counterproductively, however, the Grand Master of the Officio had not decided to tell Inquisitor Venon about this, and so she had been spending the last few days running away from Cruel. The imagined Inquisitorial assassins did not actually exist, or at the very least, they weren't behind Venon. Quite the opposite, in fact, they were in front of Venon, and now that Beast Cruel had so elegantly chased her out of hiding, she was essentially standing in the middle of an open field with her pants around her ankles. Although in this case, an open field is the largest processional leading to the biggest cathedral on Terra, but details. Speaking of details, we get some interesting information about this. So, this is one of the Grand Cathedrals of Terra, one of the biggest one on the planet, which is saying something considering the sheer bloody size of the Imperial Palace. But the really interesting thing is the description of the sheer goddamn numbers of people. Apparently, there are pilgrims standing in line for literal weeks before they are even allowed to enter the Grand Cathedral, and once inside, there's another three days of queues before they actually get to the altar, where they are allowed to spend three whole seconds in front of what is supposedly a shard of the Emperor's armor and a piece of Rogal Dorn's cloak, or alternatively, a piece of beaten bronze and a cum-stained handkerchief. You can never be entirely sure with these religious paraphernalia nonsense things. Sadly for Venon, however, she was not allowed to drink in the sights of this tiny piece of cloth and a beaten piece of supposed armor. She was getting shot at by snipers at the time, which does tend to get in the way of a fulfilling sightseeing experience. Luckily, she was saved by Beast Cruel and brought under the protection of the Officio Assassinarum. She was hidden away for long enough for her to make her way to the primary inquisitorial stronghold on Terra, where she entered into proper negotiations, without all of the guns, with her inquisitorial counterparts. Meanwhile, in space near Port Sanctus, the Orcs continue to pretend that they're Eldar, using hit-and-run attacks to try and draw the Imperial fleet into a remarkably obvious trap. Now, at the very least, the Orcs are Orcish enough to simply just create a bunch of goddamn rock space fortresses, laden them down with rockets and big old guns, and plonk them in the middle of an asteroid field. Even the stupidest Imperial Admiral would require a couple of good solid 
get waxed to the back of the head before falling for that one. But nevertheless, it is a considerable step up from the usual orc tactic of simply charging towards the enemy while screaming at the top of their lungs. Unfortunately for the Imperial Navy, they were also not in a position to take advantage of this rather obvious trap. You see, the Imperial Navy's leadership in the sector had, um... Some communications problems. You remember the over-eager Admiral that began the attack and forced High Admiral Lansung to actually show his ass and leave Terra? Well, the High Admiral hadn't shown up yet, which meant that the only people around was the said crazy-ass Admiral and his peers. The nutty Admiral, hereby referred to as Admiral Kamikaze, had done his little nonsense run against the Orc Attack Moon, gotten his ass well and truly whooped, and then ran back out into the void again. And while many of the remaining Imperial Admirals commanding their own battle groups would happily have seen Admiral Kamikaze freeze to death in the cold vacuum of space, they couldn't simply just leave an Imperial Navy battle group without support, which forced their hands. Now you had several groups of Admirals all competing to 1. Not fucking die, 2. Get out of this without making a complete and utter fall of themselves, and 3. Grab whatever glory was available. As you can probably imagine, this is not a situation that lends itself particularly well to reason to discussion and planning. In all due essentiality, this meant that one of the most powerful gathering of Imperial and Navy vessels seen since the Great Heresy was stuck in space, bickering at one another. And for once, the presence of High Admiral Lansung was actually needed, and even more rarely, the High Admiral was actually on his way, and eventually showed up at Port Sanctus. The reason why the High Admiral's presence was so necessary was because he actually had rank over any of the other Admirals. This should have been something that would have been pretty obvious to begin with. If you send a large combination of various battle forces into battle, yet you have not made it clear who is actually in command of said battle group, shit is going to go south ways. But then again, this, if anything, is just further evidence that Lansing had no intention of actually using this gargantuan gathering of naval power. Or, well... Not using it against the Orcs, anyways, using it for leverage against the other High Lords, more like. Nevertheless, the High Admiral had finally actually arrived at the battlefront, and could now take command over the Imperial Battle Group as one whole entity. Or, well, what remained of said entity, anyways, after having ran themselves ragged in front of a massive goddamn Orc battle station for the last couple weeks, while getting pelted with meteors. But hey, no plan is perfect, and when you don't have any plan whatsoever, it's doubly so not perfect. Nevertheless, the Imperial Navy did outnumber the Orcs, rather ridiculously in fact, although whether or not they could outgun them was the real question. The Orc Attack Moon was still a massive monstrous space station, bristling with weaponry, and it was by no means undefended. However, that did not matter in the slightest. Now that the Fat Admiral had gotten his overweight ass to the front line, he had no other options but to win, or to fuck off back to Terra in disgrace and probably shoot himself in the head with a lasgun. The plan that was eventually formulated to deal with the Attack Moon and its escort fleet was simple, it had to be, because complete control over the Imperial and Navy battle group was at this point essentially impossible, as it was scattered across a vast area of space, and controlling all of the elements in any sort of cohesion or coordination was virtually impossible, and uh, the plan was also remarkably brutal. The assumption was that the Orc Attack Moon would be virtually impervious to a bombardment by the fleet as it was deployed at the moment. The fleet could simply not bring to bear enough heavy firepower in a small enough section of Void to overcome the battle station's defences, not to mention its literal hundreds of metres of rock armour. This meant that the battle station would have to be destroyed from the inside out, which meant bombers. The plan, in all the essentiality, boils down to throw fucktons of Imperial Navy fighters and void bombers at it, and hope that something hits something important. It certainly wasn't the most nuanced of plans ever concocted by Imperial strategists, but uh, you can't deny that there is a certain charm in brute simplicity. The Orcs had proved as much on several occasions previously. 
And it was a success, although at considerable cost. The Imperial Navy had suffered considerable casualties before the High Admiral had arrived, and the assault upon the Orc Attack Moon and its escort fleet cost a further great toll in Imperial Navy ships. However, the brave pilots of the Imperial Navy did indeed succeed in destroying the Orc Attack Moon, making it the first actual destruction of an Orc battle station. The unfortunate side effect was that the vast majority, in fact 99% of the pilots dispatched against the moon all perished, as the simple fact is that they had to get ridiculously close, suicidally close, and then blow up an attack moon carrying enough firepower to annihilate Imperial Navy battleships. You can probably imagine that when something that powerful goes boom, the resulting boom is rather expansive. Casualty figures notwithstanding, however, High Admiral Lansung had indeed delivered the victory that he promised, and destroyed an Orc attack moon. And with such a feat beneath his belt, the High Admiral returned to Terra, sporting an ego almost comparable to that of myself, to the point where he had a song called Saviour of the Imperium played upon his arrival, which might not sound like a big deal, but the last time this particular piece of music had been played was for Rogel Dawn himself. I'll leave it up to you to put two and two together there. And that, of course, was not all. The High Admiral had put together quite the little victory parade, and had it broadcasted not only all across Terra, but to several other planets and indeed entire systems, so that everyone could see the moment when the High Admiral and the now unassailable Grand Leader of the High Council take credit for absolutely goddamn everything. To put it bluntly, it would appear that High Admiral Langsung's political, financial, and military position was now utterly unassailable. For a whole five fucking minutes, until an orc attack moon vastly larger than the one that Lansung had destroyed popped into being above Holy Terra itself. And on that planet-sized cliffhanger, I, as well as the book, will leave you. For a whole month. Because fuck you. That's why. Don't blame me. Blame Games Workshop and Black Library. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.